We're going to try to proceed. The rabbi's got a message to give you that's what you want to hear. Uh, I would appreciate it very much if you hold any comments down while his message is, while, while he's talking to you. If you've got anything to say, there'll be time afterwards. And uh, let's everybody enjoy themselves. And uh, I give the rabbi a fair In August of 1929, in Hebron, the Arabs massacred 67 Jews in one day. There were no occupied territories of 1967. What was bothering the Arabs in 1929? Who was inciting the Arabs in 1929? Kahana? It wasn't even born. Between 1936 and 1938, the Arabs in the land of Israel massacred 510 Jewish men, women, and children. What did they want then? Who was inciting them then? Peter Jennings? What occupied lands were they talking about then? What did they want then? What was troubling them and then? The Israeli army, which didn't exist? The state of Israel, which didn't exist? In 1947, the United Nations proposed a partition plan, which would have created a Jewish state and an Arab state. An Arab state which would have included the occupied lands, and the great deal more. And they turned it down, and they went to war, and 6,000 Jews died in that war. What was bothering the Arabs then? What occupied lands did they want given back to them then? In 1967, those who, who, who remember the two weeks that preceded the Six-Day War. As Arab men, women, and children throughout the Arab world shouted and marched and cheered, it bucked your hood, slaughtered the Jew. And the Jews into the sea. At that time, they had Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. At that time, they had East Jerusalem. What did they want then when they went to war? And where was Tom Brokaw then? And where was ABC and CBS and NBC and the Los Angeles Times? Peace now? We should give up the occupied territories and then there will be peace now? They don't want peace now. The issue is not the occupied lands of 67. The issue is the existence of the state of Israel. The issue is whether we are going to be such fools and fall prey to such delusions again. And once again, we turn to the, the days of the 1920s and 1930s. No guilt and no apologies. We owe the world nothing, not a thing, not one inch of Jewish land. I'm ready to compromise on only one thing. We'll keep all the land, but I'm ready to give up all the Arabs. <laughs>
in Samaria. Last April, they found this body, the body of an eight-year-old child in a cave near his home. The one who found him told me later that the Arabs had beaten the child's face in so badly there was no face left. Did that appear on ABC? Was that a page one story for the Los Angeles Times? Did Woody Allen write an op-ed piece in the New York Times? I wish that Woody would peck away at someone else's dream. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the Shiva, the seven-day mourning period, in the home of the Chaba family. And when I came in, the mother stood up and she shouted at me, Tafteach Kimi Kamat, promise me revenge. That's a mother who lost an eight-year-old child. A child who was very with, without a face. Who cared about it, who spoke about it. And where was Rabbi Schindler? Rabbi Schindler. As in, in Time Magazine, they would say Schindler rhymes with Swindler. <laughs> When Christian Arabs massacred Muslim Arabs, where are all the temple rabbis who felt it necessary to force their congregants to rise on your Kippur and beat their breasts? Rabbis who are suffering from a, a pernicious form of Jewish AIDS called guilt. <laughs> Incredible. What a sickness. Jews, <laughs> no one feels as guilty as Jews. We have honed it to a fine art. We feel guilty for ev everything, whether we did or didn't do it. We feel guilty about it. <coughs> These rabbis mention Rabbi Chava in their sermons. And Nava Elimelech, an eight-year-old girl whose body was found cut in pieces. And the one who, who did it, did it as to pass an initiation to join the PLO. Was that mentioned in the Los Angeles Times? Or by Michael Jackson? Another winner. <laughs> I doubt that there are five people in, the, in this room who know the name of Shetamon. Shetamon was 19 years old when he died. He was a 19-year-old Jewish soldier. Now that concept of Jewish soldier is not such a throwaway concept. For 1900 years, we had no Jewish soldiers. For 1900 years, the only soldiers that we knew were the other ones. For 1900 years, we pray that someday we would come back to our country and we too would have to pay Jewish soldier. In August of 1984, a Jewish soldier named Moshe Tamam, 19 years old, stood at Sot Bethlehem, the Bethlehem crossroads near Netanya, four kilometers from Netanya, which is in the heart of Israel. It's not in the West Bank. It's not in the Bank of North America. It's not in the occupied territories of Yossi Sarin or Shimani Aloni or all the other sicknesses that I have to that I have to sit with daily. <laughs> the Tanya is in the heartland of Israel. It is within the green line. In August of 1984, a Jewish soldier, 19 years old, stands in broad daylight. He hitches a right. Now, from this point, what I tell you is what I heard as I sat in the military courtroom in Lut, in Lida, at the trial of the four Arabs that murdered Moshe Tamam. The car stopped, and in the car were four Arabs. Now, lest you immediately think that these were bad Arabs, 
from the occupied territories, from Hebron uh, and Shem and Jenin and Tukat, or maybe from Jordan. I like to tell you quickly, immediately, that that's not true. They were for Israeli Arabs. They were good Arabs. They were our Arabs. The four Israeli Arabs from the Israeli Arab town of Batka al Nobia, which is in the little triangle, 10 kilometers, six miles from Netanya. They were our Arabs, Israeli citizens, the ones to whom we gave education and the job and the car in which they rode and which they picked up with Shetamah. They asked the soldier, Lan Chayal, where to soldier? He did not know that they were Arabs because Israeli Arabs drive with the same license plates as Israeli Jews. And we would not want that to be different, God forbid. God forbid we would not want to discriminate so that an Israeli soldier hitching a ride will know that he is being picked up by Arabs. We would not want that because that is racism, that is fascism, that is Hitlerism, that is insanity. So he didn't know, and he told them where he was going, and they said, get in the car, that's exactly where we're headed. They took him to their village, Bak al Galbia, and for two days they tortured him. They took out his eyes and cut off his sexual organs. Did you hear about it? Was it a page one story in the LA Times? Was the page 31 story in the LA Times? Was the page 2031 story? Did it ever appear in the LA Times? Did Dan Rather speak about it? Did George Bush speak about it? Did anyone speak about it? Sometimes I believe that I'm living in Israel in a country that is in need of a national couch. <laughs> I cannot begin to believe how insane we are. My son just returned from Army duty in the territories. He says the soldiers have had it. And give him a gun, and you can't shoot. <laughs> you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. If they throw stones at you, you, you can't shoot because there is not a life endangering situation. Two weeks ago, a border policeman on the Temple Mount, as the Arabs rioted, was dragged in by Arab, by, by Muslims into El Aqsa Mosque. He was there alone with hundreds of Arabs screaming and beating him and trying to kill him. And he shot in the air twice. In the hospital later, I asked him, Maitha, what's with you? Why don't you shoot? And he said, Maitha, what's with you? He said, if I would have shot the Muslim and killed him in El Aqsa Mosque, they would have thrown the key away. I would have sat the rest of my life in jail. That's the insanity. A Jewish soldier risks his life and, the, and, is, and is afraid to shoot because they'll, they'll give him a life sentence. What other country has its soldiers have stones thrown at them, and they throw the stones back. <laughs> Insanity. It's a snake pit. <coughs> stones don't kill. There was a group of Israelis in this country just recently, victims of Arab terror, families who have lost their children to Arab terrorists. And one was the Ohana family from Bejan. Their daughter, Esther, 20 years old, was riding to the Arab village of Daria. And the car was stoned, the stone struck her in the head, and she was killed. She died. 
She was hit in the head by a stone and she died. The Eged bus driver who lives in Kirt Alba while driving through Khadhu, a stone was thrown, hit the window, his eye was put out. And Shimon Peris, that unclean bird that Peris, floats around. Babbling, but still, we have to, we, we should only react properly. React properly, what an insane country. When we shoot the Arabs, the road screams and we back away. So then we start beating them up. The road screams, so we stop beating them up, and there's this curfew. The road screams, you're starving them. We stop, now we're shooting them again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, normal people, it's a government, it's not a government, it's a two-headed government, both of whom are headless. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. They have no rule, they have no policy. The Israeli army, which defeated Arab armies in six days, can't put down women and children. If I was the Minister of Defense for two hours, there would be no more rioting. They are destroying the army. They're taking young Jewish soldiers and driving them crazy. They're destroying them psychologically. Israel TV spits forth its poison every single single night, showing his pictures of Ahmedah, the Miskinim, these poor Arab civilians. And some Arab woman starts crying out, her, her poor in, innocent baby, her poor innocent son has been arrested. Poor innocent son. Poor innocent son. <clears throat> they are filling the minds of the young Israelis with doubts. The young Israeli now has doubts whether he is indeed just, whether maybe the Arabs are not right. We're destroying ourselves with guilt, with self-hate, with complexes. No guilt. What do we owe the Arabs who would, if they could, they would massacre us men, women, and children if they could. And we sit and we talk about Rahmanu, mercy. Mercy? The Ramban, one of the great biblical commentators speaks about mercy and then he says there's also a the mercy of fools and he says to the mercy of fools all justice is lost mercy we're insane mercy against people who would kill us if they could the rabbis of the Talmud put it much, much better and much more clearly. If one comes to slay you, slay him first. That's a Jewish way. That's a normal way. When my son returned from Lebanon, he's in Tokhanim, in artillery. He told me, we're not normal. They received orders that if they feel opposition, is placed within an Arab village that the artillery was not to give fire cover to the infantry, lest God forbid they kill our civilians. Do you know how many Jewish soldiers died in Lebanon because of that insane order? Because of that Rachmanush of Kibshim, that mercy of fools? Arab civilians? All the Arab siblings in Lebanon are not worth the life of one Jewish soldier to me. I want a Jewish soldier to go into, into battle knowing that his commanding officer is thinking about him 
and not some Arab civilian. And he's doing his best to ensure that he will live During World War II, Allied bombers would bomb German cities every night. A thousand bombers every night would bomb cities. Who do you think they were killing there? Generals? <laughs> they bombed a German population which was supporting a government which aimed to destroy the world. And so they pounded them to break them. That was normal. Day. We suffer from 1900 years of galut of exile. It has warped us. We have become a warped people. Having lived for 1900 years as losers, we don't know how to cope with being winners. Well, I love to win. I think winning is so great after being a loser for 1900 years. Apologize for winning, for living. I think living is so much better than dying. Don't try it. Mm -hmm. Take my word for it. <laughs> I love to live. I love to win. And I love a Jewish state that survives. And I love a Jewish state that's hated by ABC and NBC and CBS rather than an Auschwitz that is loved by all of them. No guilt, no explanation, no apology. We owe them nothing. The world that stood by during the Holocaust, not lifting a finger. Roosevelt, the great liberal, the one who is the one. When he died, every Jew wept and wept and wept, and he was a person who could have saved hundreds of thousands of Jews just by bombing the railroad lines, leading to the death camp, and he was begged and he was pleaded, and he refused. Who do we owe? The Vatican? We owe the Vatican something? An international peace conference. That's what we should have. And guess who's coming to dinner? The Russians, the Chinese, and guess who's the dinner? <laughs> international peace conference. You take a piece of it, you take a piece of it, and you take a piece of it. <laughs> There will be no peace conference. You mind your own business. We will solve our problems. If the Arabs want to sit down with us, they'll sit down with us and they'll be told. Not one inch of Jewish territory. the survival of Israel. They do not recognize any issue of any size, of any shape, and of any form. That is the issue. And let the Jews learn this. Jews of peace now and peace in 12 seconds. <laughs> foolish Jews, foolish, insane Jews. The Rebbe of, of Kutz once said a tremendous thing. He said, it is a sin to deceive someone. It's a crime to deceive yourself. The Jews are the greatest criminals in the entire world. We love to deceive ourselves. Well, maybe this time it's different. Maybe this time they really mean it. Maybe, maybe, maybe. The Arabs began four wars with us. And they lost four wars with us. And they had better learn. If you start a war and you lose, you lose. <laughs> the greatest tragedy that in the past decade was the Camp David Accord. What an insanity. 
country. What a madness. Egypt starts three wars with us, kills thousands of our soldiers, loses, and then says, let's go back to go. Let's have peace. Give us, give us the sign up. Winners don't give up then. Losers lose. Winners win. We will yet suffer. We will yet pay for that terrible mistake. When they learned to use the F-16s and the M-68 tanks, we'll pay for it. Their troops are 35 miles from Ashkelon, where before that, our troops were 70 miles from Cairo. Peace, there will be no peace with them. And I want peace more than anyone who, who sits in this room. Certainly more than Alexander Schindler or Woody with his, with his newfound satchel. <laughs> I want peace more than Schindler because I don't live in New York City. I live in Israel and I serve in the army and my son does and my son's in law do and I want peace more than he, he does. What an obscene thing. Peace now. Who doesn't want peace now? We all want peace now. But there's not going to be peace because they don't want peace. Zionism didn't come into being for peace. It came into being for a Jewish state, hopefully with peace. Peace or no peace, a Jewish state. You want peace? I'll give you peace. I'll give you a guaranteed peace. Give up Israel. Guaranteed peace. You want that? I don't want that. The problem is that the Arabs within the land of Israel, including the state of Israel, are a fifth Call them in our midst. Right. They are a cancer that is eating away at the Jewish state, and it is a cancer that is spreading. The problem is not only violence. There is a demographic problem. They have babies. Many, many, many babies. We pay them for their babies because we are not normal. <laughs> every baby, every month, a check. Two babies, two checks, ten babies, ten checks, twenty babies, a book of checks. <laughs> what normal people subsidizes its own suicide? We, because we are not normal. <laughs> it was an article in the paper two months ago about an Arab an Israeli Arab from the Bedouin town of Rahat in the Negev. He is the father of 48 children from six wives. He's not finished. <laughs> Every month he shows up at the post office and he receives 48 checks from the Friarim, the church in Israel. Every month, millions of Jewish dollars go to pay for our babies who, will, who are on their way to the great dream of becoming the majority in Israel. And we sit by choir. And we sit by column. And peace now says, there's a, you're right, God is right, there's a problem. That's why we have to give up the miracles. Of course, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> and what does he think is happening in the Galilee, which is not the territory, but the part of the state of Israel inside the Green Line? What does he think is happening there? The Galilee today has a majority of Arabs, today already. The Western Galilee is 82% Arabs today. And when you drive from Akko to Tzfat, besides Kamiel, there is 
no Jewish settlement there. It is all Arab. That's our Northern Ireland. And there they demonstrate and shout, Nirder Tagalib, the Dam of an Epish. We will liberate the Galilee with blood and with soul. The Galilee? The Galilee? <laughs> But that's part of the state of Israel. Both go told. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> what will we do in five years when suddenly there is a real they riot in the Galilee and they shoot and we shoot and we kill and every day Peter Jennings will show in the Galilee and Israeli soldiers shot two more children today in the Galilee. So peace now will say, listen, there's a danger. We have to give up the Galilee. Galilee, we will be soon left with the name right. <laughs> the problem is that Jewish liberals have contempt for Arabs. Jewish liberals run around saying, if we if we raise the Arab living standards then they'll be good Arabs. If we give them electricity, then they'll be much cheaper <laughs> If we give them indoor toilets, they'll sit quietly. <laughs> it takes a certain kind of a mind, a mind that runs to indoor toilets. <laughs> to think that you can buy an Arab's national pride by giving him pain and black violence. What come time for Arabs? The Arabs believe that the Jews are thieves. They believe that. Of course they're wrong. But they believe. We sit the shimmers and the swimmers of this world talking about we need the living standards. Liberals think you can buy everything. Buy a condominium, a Cadillac, and an Arab. You can't. You can't. The Arabs have national pride. Sometimes I listen to Jewish leaders who are here and back home in Israel. Now, I'm appalled. I'm amazed. I'm astounded. I'll hear a Jewish leader get up at a breakfast or a brunch, or a lunch, or a dinner, or a supper, any way that Jews raise money by eating. And they'll get up and they'll say, we came to the land and we found the desert and turned it into a garden. Write a check. <laughs> sounds, sounds nice? Try it on an arrow. They'll tell you, you're right. But it was my desert, now it's your garden. And that's the way I understand. That's the way I understand. You think that the Arab refugees in, in Lebanon want to go back to Judea and Samaria, the West Bank? They never came from there. Not one Arab refugee in Lebanon comes from Judea and Samaria. They all come from the Galilee and from Haifa. That's where they want to go back. There's not one Arab refugee in Gaza who comes from Judea and Samaria. They come from Ramle. They come from Lul. They come from Yafo. That's where they want to go back. And Shindler plays his game with himself and with the Arabs. The Arabs hate Israel. There's not one Arab that doesn't hate living in a country which is called the Jewish state. How would you like living in Jerry Powell's Christian state? You, you would love it, right? Yes. That's how they love living in a Jewish state. Pretty games. There's not one Arab in Israel who, who doesn't hate living in a country which has, as its basic law, the law of return, which says, that every Jew has an automatic right to come to Israel and be a citizen. Every Jew, except we are not Jewish. Every Jew, but no Arabs. How many Arabs like that law? How many Arabs love that law? And 
And by the way, what kind of law is that says any Jew? If Ben Gurion hadn't passed that, that law in 1950, and there would be no such law, and I would come to the Knesset tomorrow and present a bill, word for word, the same word for word, you know what they would call me? They would call me what they call me. A racist. <laughs> what a schizophrenic people. What a dishonest people. How many Arabs enjoy singing their national anthem in Israel? Hatikva. <laughs> I tell you, it is a pleasure to see an Arab getting up to sing Hatikva. It is a, he stands up there with his chest out. His, his shoulders back and pride as he sings the words, never should he hold me up, the soul of the Jew yearns. I tell you, he just collapses with emotion. <laughs> <laughs> and when he reaches the climax and he says, the hope of 2,000 years, tears. <laughs> and he says, ah, oh, am I saying the way to 2,000 years to Jews to come home? I think God means the hope. It was the Jewish hope. It was the Arab nightmare. <laughs> How many Arabs on Yom Atzmutani on Independence Day rushing to the streets of Israel to celebrate their defeat? <laughs> but of course, we will make them Zionists by giving them indoor toilets. <laughs> The Arab birth rate is enormous. It is four times that of the Jews. They have babies and Jewish women have abortion. 30,000 last year, but that's all right. The main thing is that it's my body. <laughs> so their birth rate is enormous. And on top of that, there is no Aliyah. What Aliyah today? Who's going to Israel today? The Zionists of Los Angeles? They do their Zionizing out of Busha Boulevard. <laughs> what Aliyah? I sit on the Knesset committee on Aliyah. I know the figures. I know the real figures. <laughs> Not the ones publishing the Jewish Journal. <laughs> oh, come on, I tell you, what a mafia rig that is. <laughs> <laughs> One, I, have to, I have to give them credit. They really are liberal. They wouldn't even take a paid ad for this meeting tonight. Unbelievable. 